to um, view it later and learn how to use this, this great tool uh, that Earthworks and some of their partners have put together for us. Um, right now, I'd like to introduce my co-presenters. Uh, they are Molly Dunton, who is with the Citizens Empowerment Project and is a methane coordinator with Earthworks. Also, um, Nadia Steinzor, who is the Eastern Program Coordinator with Earthworks. We are going to get uh, started with Molly Dutton's presentation, and she is going to go in depth um, on the and how to use this tool. And I will let you take over, Molly. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, can everyone see my screen? Okay. I will take that as a I, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see it well, Molly. It's Nadia, so I'm hoping everybody Great. else can as well. If folks have any problems, you can chat us. Great, yes. Um, we will take questions at the end, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to um, email them to us or use, use the chat function or the questions function in GoToWebinar. Um, thanks so much to Cheryl and to Nadia and to all you guys for, for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Molly. I work with Earthworks. Um, I have the pleasure of managing the oil and gas threat map project. It was a, a great um, effort by Earthworks, Clean Air Task Force, Frack Tracker, as well as a whole bunch of other um, organizations and partner groups that uh, contributed data and expertise. Um, so this is really um, a, a great example of collaboration. Um, and the tool itself is completely unbranded, so um, you know, not one group is taking credit. Um, so if you've not seen the oil and gas threat map, this is a very basic uh, view of what the map has to offer. But I'm going to get into a little bit more detail on the colors later, um, but I just wanted to start with this, this visual so you guys can have it in your head as we're kind of going along. But first I want to talk about why we built the map. Um, the map is a great tool to influence federal policy, state policy, as well as raise awareness in the environmental community, as well as among average Americans who might not know that they've got this stuff going on right in their backyards or in their counties or even in their states. Um, Earthworks and Sierra Club did a little bit of polling between our uh, membership lists and uh, folks that live in close proximity to oil and gas um, really do care about reducing the pollution in their community. Um, so really what we really hope that this tool is useful to folks who want to learn more about what's going on around them um, and ideally access some resources and maybe even take action. So this right here is the basis for the threat map. The yellow area that you're looking at is a half mile threat radius that we've drawn around active wells, compressor stations, and processing plants in the US. Um, so this does not include pipelines or other types of facilities and it is um, specific to active facilities, so not future development. Um, but we feel that this is a pretty, a pretty accurate representation of oil and gas production and transmission today. So what's in the map and what's in this half mile threat radius? Well, first of all, um, I should tell you guys how we generated it. <laughs> a half mile, how did we pick a half mile? Um, essentially, what we first did was we mapped all the active facilities that I just listed. And then from there, we, we really felt that it was important to draw some kind of threat zone or threat radius um, around those facilities that would work to explain the risk and the potential impacts from living you know, within a specific distance to these facilities. So we looked at the current and leading peer-reviewed literature out there and you know, the best research that we could find, and we found that there were um, recorded and notable health impacts as well as peak levels of air toxins from oil and gas facilities anywhere from 0.1 mile up into a mile away from these um, facilities. And there were even studies attributing you know, local emission spikes to natural gas storage facilities hundreds of miles away. So we chose a half mile. Um, we felt that it was a pretty uh, conservative distance that we could defend to our critics, um, but also that it would uh, restrict itself to you know, the most severe or intense impacts. Um, and another reason we chose a half mile was we could um, draw that line being inclusive of conventional as well as unconventional drilling and the impacts of those activities. So within the radius, we've, we use census data to calculate what's going on within this radius and who's actually living there. 
So we have totals for the affected people, as well as what kinds of people are living in, in this uh, yellow radius, um, as well as the number of schools and hospitals that fall within a half mile to active oil and gas facilities. These are just a few of the stats that uh, we were able to pull once the map was built. Again, using census data and other types of data, um, public government data. Um, so we know that almost 12 and a half million people in the United States live within a half mile to an active oil or gas facility. Um, it's a pretty big number. Um, that radius encompasses an area larger than the state of California. Um, and there are over 11,000 schools that are within a half mile. Another layer that we have in the oil and gas threat map is the air toxics risk data. So what you're seeing here is a county by county color coding ranking system based on um, oil and gas public health risks. So the places that are darkest red have the highest um, recorded health risks due to oil and gas air emissions. Um, and out of this analysis, we were able to, to uh, Sorry, to pull that to almost 248 counties in 21 states are above the EPA's level of concern for both cancer risk as well as respiratory illness risk. So cleaner, the Cleaner Task Force is responsible for this great analysis that has really, um, really rounded out our map. Um, and they were able to extrapolate data based off of the EPA's National Air Toxics Risk Assessment. This is something that the EPA does um, every five years or so to analyze the air toxics that exist in our environment. So what Clean Air Task Force did was they pulled out the oil and gas specific air toxins. Um, and they did the same thing for the National Emissions Inventory. Um, and they looked at, you know, what EPA thinks to be concerning or not concerning. And then from all of that data, they were able to come up with this color coding. Um, so it's a pretty great analysis. We're really grateful to have worked with them. These are some of the known um, hazardous air pollutants that are emitted by the oil and gas industry and some of the symptoms that one can experience after being exposed to these kinds of chemicals. And all, all this information, as well as more, can be found in the Clean Air Task Force report um, that was the basis for all of this data and how we got the layer for the map, um, fossil fumes. And we will be sending a link to this report as, with the slides and other materials. So when you put them together, you've got this image that I showed you guys in the beginning. Um, and, you know, this is really powerful, I think, because we can see a pretty strong overlap between the areas that have intensive amounts of drilling and other types of, you know, oil and gas activity with the areas that have the highest known health risk. So now I'd like to take, to take you guys to the actual map and show you a little bit about what the map can do and how to use it. So essentially, this is a close-up of the great state of Ohio. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little, a little bit further here. Um, this is a kind of a close-up of the Carrollton area. And so essentially what you can see here is the yellow is the half-mile buffer around all of the active facilities, so the half-mile threat radius. And we can see that Carroll County um, is very much in the red, which, you know, you can see over on, on the left we have the legend, and it will actually kind of give you a better sense of where that red falls. It's not an exact science, but, you know, it was our best way of visually representing the risks. You can also see that we've got some videos on the map, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. So here, if you click on any county on the map, um, you'll get a little pop-up box that will actually show you and tell you how many people live within the threat radius, how many oil and gas facilities there are, et cetera. If we um, zoom in even further, more data is available and visible. Um, so if we get into actually more of the city level, the metropolitan level, um, we can now see schools and hospitals that fall within the radius. So if you click on any one of these dots, you'll get the name of the school. If it's a hospital, you get the name of the hospital. And we can even do that for oil and gas facilities. In this case, I'm assuming most of these are wells. Um, but if you click on, oh, I don't have a screenshot of that, but if you click on any one of these dots, You'll get a little pop-up box again that, that tells you the name of the well or whatever facility, um, as well as the location, who operates it, um, and what kind of facility that it is. Um, and so I just want to point out here, in this screenshot, I also have the layers turned on. So this is a great function of the map. You can really customize your experience and turn on or turn off or, you know, show all or show none. The data, you can really, you know, uh, fine-tune it to the view that you want to see and the kind of the information that you care about. 
So we, we um, built the map in the form of state maps because it's a lot faster and easier to use that way. Um, and you can see here we've got some really, you know, each state really tells its own story. But we do have the national map, um, and obviously this is a screenshot from the Marcellus Shale, Utica Shale area. Um, and the national map is really great to look at this issue for more of a regional issue. Um, also in the map, as I mentioned before, we've got some videos that you can view right in the map. We have some infrared FLIR videos. This is something that Earthworks does as a part of our work. Um, and you can, again, view them right here in the map. If anybody is uh, less familiar with the FLIR infrared technology, uh, this is a great uh, demonstration of basically what this technology does. It makes the, the normally invisible um, air pollution, but also heat and exhaust, it makes that visible. So we can actually get a picture of what it is that's being dumped into the air, and we can begin to understand it a little better. We also have um, over 50 te testimonials from impacted communities in the map. Um, this is Jeff Bond from Noble County. And later on this summer, we're going to be adding some data to the map on ozone, so oil and gas um, specific ozone and smog, as well as some more information in the population breakdown on um, affected people under the age of 18, so affected children as well as affected elderly over 65. And we'll also be adding an, an, a layer of analysis on the, the total number of affected Native Americans, which was unfortunately left out of uh, this first round. I don't know if I mentioned, but we do have the breakdown for uh, Latinos as well as African Americans. So right now I'm just going to take two minutes and actually bring you guys to the threat map. So this is oilandgasthreatmap.com. As I mentioned before, it's completely unbranded and free to the public. Um, you're welcome to access this anytime, and uh, we hope that it lives up here in, in forever. Um, it's mobile responsive, so you can pull it up on your phone and, and go to your state page and access some statistics about your state. Um, we've got, you know, these are some of the same stats that I showed you guys in the beginning, and the map has given us the amazing ability to calculate all these figures at the national level, at the state level, and also at the county level. Um, so I'm just going to go in here and get to the Ohio map. So here we're on real time. This is quite interesting because we can see that there's a lot of uh, yellow, which means there's a lot of people living in really close proximity, but the relative red and pinks are not as dark. Um, you know, the Pennsylvania map looks very differently. And there's a lot of, you know, just because a county doesn't necessarily have a dark shading doesn't mean that they don't experience um, local issues with air quality. And so one of the biggest kind of disclaimers, so to speak, with all this data is that the risks are always higher and the exposure is always more certain for those living really close and in closer proximity. So essentially kind of the, the main argument here is that the closer you live, um, the higher at risk you could potentially be. Um, but one of the features I wanted to demonstrate for you guys was the search. So it functions a lot like a Google search, where when you start to type in, op, you know, start to type in a word, you get some options. So here we are in Barnesville. I'm going to zoom back out a little bit so we can actually see what's going on here. It looks like we've got some videos as well as some hospitals that unfortunately find themselves within a half mile. This is a video of the Barnesville West compressor. We can view it right here in the, in the map, which is a great function. Um, as well as if I click here on the county, we get all the information um, on Belmont County that the map is able to produce. And over here on the side, um, we have base maps, so you can change if you'd like to see a satellite view. You can always turn off the different layers. As well as when you get far enough down, you can turn on the ability to view the oil and gas facilities. Um, you have to be pretty far zoomed in to see the facilities. Otherwise, if we, if we allowed them to show up at the national level, the map would never load because there's just simply too many of them. Um, so we had to force the map to only show these to you at a pretty uh, low level. So this is a historically owned well, and so on. 
So there's a lot of great things that you can do um, in the map. You know, as we scroll out, we get a much richer view. Um, but again, I mean, folks can come on and you can search, just like Google, you can search your school, you can type in your address, you could put in your county, um, et cetera, and folks can, can really come on and use this tool to really figure out what's going on around them or their family or friends who might be, you know, living in an area with oil and gas. So that concludes my presentation, but like I said, I, I'm really happy to always help people kind of figure out how to use the, the map and use the tool to their benefit, whatever your political agenda might be or whatever your personal agenda might be. You know, there's, there's always um, an application, I think, in this map. There's a lot of different um, information here, and we hope that people find it useful. So please reach out to me with any questions. Um, my contact info is obviously included in this slide and will be a part of the materials that are circulated. And thank you so much. So now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Nadia. Great. Thanks, Molly. Um, are you making me presenter or should I? Oh, you are. Thank you so much. <laughs> right there. It's always a little lag when we're online. Okay. Can everyone see my screen and my slides okay? Yes, you can. Yeah. Okay, great. So, <clears throat> hi everyone. Thanks for um, joining us tonight. Um, it's great to be able to do this webinar. Um, I'm sitting here in New York State. Cheryl's in Ohio and Molly's in DC. So we're forever grateful for this technology to be able to connect um, with all of you. And um, as Cheryl said, I'm the Eastern Program Coordinator for Earthworks, and I have had uh, the very interesting um, job in the last several years working directly with communities um, affected by oil and gas development, as well as doing research and reports on impacts to expose um, some of the information that, that is growing. So tonight I want to talk about um, understanding health threats, because that's the main um, focus of the threat map, obviously. And you know, understanding threats um, and understanding the science is pretty complicated, and I know it can be very frustrating with pe for people who are affected um, to not always be believed. Um, so I'm going to um, try to put some context to that. So um, as as Molly mentioned, and as the threat map demonstrates, uh, many places and people are already living with toxic air as well as water uh, threats to their water and soil and quality of life. Um, and as oil and gas development expands, um, it's pretty likely it's going to get worse, um, even if the industry improves its operations to some degree. So for a long time, industry and its champions um, dismissed reports of health impacts by residents as mere anecdotes um, and insisted that their problems were very few and isolated. Uh, so in addition to being fairly insulting, I'll just put it that way, to people who were actually experiencing new impacts when drilling came to town. Um, it also left communities and individuals living with oil and gas development knowing that that wasn't true, but having a really hard time demonstrating it. And communities right now and individuals really continue to bear the burden of proof. Um, so because of huge gaps in the regulatory agencies and our public policies around oil and gas, it's really been, and practices by the um, industry, it's really been up to individuals to monitor their air, get their water tested, and um, seek medical help when they have problems. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know and what we don't know to help in that process of bearing the burden of proof. Um, it's very clear this is an industrial activity and the toxic effects and the chemicals used and the type of emissions produced are very well established. Um, the endocrine disruption exchange back already in 2011 reviewed over 600 chemicals used in gas operations and concluded that the majority cause or have the potential to cause short and long-term impacts. So it's no question that this is a polluting um, industry with the potential to cause health effects. Um, and now evidence is really on the rise. Um, at first the industry said it's all anecdotes, then they switched to you don't have peer-reviewed science. And now what's amazing is the increase in peer-reviewed studies in just the last few years. Um, physicians, scientists, and engineers for healthy energy 
recently did an analysis in which they identified 685 peer-reviewed publications on the impacts of shale and tight gas development. The vast majority had been conducted just since 2013. And what they found was that 84% of those that focused on health and 87% that focused on air quality showed elevated risks and impacts. Now that said, um, you know, all of this peer-reviewed science kind of pointing in the same direction, uh, exposure really varies. So, you know, we can say a half mile to a mile and beyond, you can still experience effects. The, the actual exposure that occurs and then the individual risk of getting sick can be very variable, um, which is also kind of a confounding um, situation in, in the science. So both episodic and intense and continuous low-level pollution matter. There's um, some great research out of the Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project demonstrating that when you have intense events like a pressure release or a flaring event from a compressor station or a well site um, or when a, when a multi-well site is, under, is being fractured, you can have a lot of reaction and, and health impacts. At the same time, your low-level pollution matters because it can be ongoing. Um, the distance that you're from uh, the facility certainly does matter, but also wind direction, as well as your own health status. You know, if you have pre-existing asthma, if you have a pre-existing cardiac condition, and your routines, are you home a lot? Do your kids play in, in the yard like, like the one in the picture? Um, or are you out of the house all the time when there's drilling going on? Another thing that can really create a lot of variability and, and make it difficult to sort of quote unquote prove, um, and we'll talk about that later, but kind of demonstrate health impacts are that we have very limited standards. So there's only a few hundred actual pollutants that come out of the industry that, that there are health standards for, and those safe levels, what are considered you know, the maximum contaminant level or what's considered safe for health, what your health-based standards are have been developed through testing and studies that are based on single contaminants for set points in time. And we know that life, I don't need to tell all of you, <laughs> you're, I'm sure many of you are living with this, so life with oil and gas can mean exposure and you know, being in the, in the pathway of multiple chemicals even at low levels. So for example, Earthworks has done quite a bit of, of air testing and we, we can turn up you know, a dozen chemicals, but they're all at levels that are below the safety standard. But what does it mean when people are exposed to a cocktail of chemicals at low levels? We just don't have the standards and methods to interpret that very well, though it's improving. And as I mentioned before, uh, regulatory agencies are just not doing much monitoring. It's, uh, most of the air monitors and the water testing that's done is for public supplies and urban areas. So that's not where a lot of the, um, of the impacts are occurring as the map of Ohio demonstrated, you know, out in Car Carroll County, for example. Then the final point, and then I'll move on to the next slide, um, is cumulative impacts are really being ignored. So, you know, you might have a health situation, you might be an individual who can, you know, generally deal with the impacts of a well site near you, um, but when more and more development comes in, when pipelines are added, compressor stations are added, a, de de a battery of dehydration tanks are added, that's cumulative impacts in an area over time. And unfortunately, when permitting, um, these facilities and considering whether, you know, the environmental impacts, um, cumulative impacts are supposed to be considered, but the analysis is usually pretty weak. So I'm going to just go briefly into what the major pollution pathways are from oil and gas development, and it's basically everything. Um, you know, you can have your very large um, processings and compressor station facilities like the one up here um, on the top. That's actually the Humphreys Station um, in Ohio. And that's an extremely large facility. And then you can also have pipeline connections and tanks um, to process the gas and pull off the liquids. And then flaring and venting, which operators need to do to release pressure because methane, after all, is explosive um, and they don't want their facilities to blow up. Um, so they often will release pressure. 
And all of those things um, are cause air emissions and cause problems for people. So it can be general operations also. You have truck traffic, all these stacks and engines, um, lots of leaks, which Cheryl will be talking about later with um, the US EPA um, methane rule is designed to go after all of these leaks. And that's a classic cumulative impact. You might have one or two leaks at a facility, but when you start having them across a facility or across an area, it can be a lot of emissions. Um, in, interestingly, um, there have been some recent studies, um, including one just the other day out of Colorado, that showed that actually oil and gas production um, can have a big impact on air quality. And um, like the flowback stage, when a lot of the chemicals and water are coming back from underground, um, volatizing into the air of different contaminants, like from large open impoundments, and even when fracturing or drilling are occurring. And truck traffic, if, as I'm sure a lot of you know, is a constant um, issue at, at every stage. Um, and then com more and more with the infrastructure build out, you're getting compressor stations to push the gas through the pipelines and pump and metering and pigging stations to deal with it as it goes through the goes um, on the transportation route. And more and more, and this is really a major issue for Eastern Ohio um, that is being set up to be kind of the processing hub. And you've got a lot of these cryogenic plants and processing facilities um, that are designed to split off and create the liquids, which are extremely profitable for the industry. Um, and I'm sorry to say that Eastern Ohio is really Eastern Ohio and Western Pennsylvania and a little bit of, of West Virginia, that triangle there is really look, being looked at now as the processing hub going into the future. So um, I know we're here to talk primarily about air and the threat map and the methane rules all focus on air, but I wanted to um, talk just briefly about water and noise as health issues and when the um, unconventional drilling boom started, um, it, most of the focus was on water, and now it's taken a few years for people to start looking at air. But there's a lot of um, research about water, and um, water contamination could be very sudden, um, like a drilling job starts near you, and you start noticing gunk coming through your water, um, or a change in odor. Um, or it can take some time to show up. Um, but one thing is clear, once your water, once people's water has been contaminated, it's very hard for them to regain trust um, that it's okay, especially if a lot of the contamination was odorless or colorless, um, and yet they were getting really sick um, or had livestock die from drinking the water. So it's a really uh, tough situation um, for people when, when their water goes bad. And a lot of the water contamination has been caused by methane and chemical migration, which could be due to the casing failure in the actual um, well, the actual oil or gas well, as well as the fractures that are caused in the rock um, where, where uh, chemicals and methane can migrate over time. And then, of course, you can have surface uh, problems. Um, many, many people in Ohio rely on private uh, water wells, and so if you have a chemical spill or a waste spill, it can percolate, literally percolate down into the soil and eventually um, reach the aquifer. And then drilling and fracturing um, can actually, there have been a few studies showing that it can actually change the water table and water flow. Um, there have been some cases of that in western Pennsylvania um, where research showed that that happened, um, and that's why an entire community's water was affected. And now noise, um, never to be underrated, and probably add to this constant light from these um, drill sites. And I just want to emphasize that both intense and low-level noise matter. A lot of people describe flaring and um, compressor station um, blowdowns as sounding like jet engines taking off and that their houses shake. Um, and so that kind of intense event can be extremely um, stressful and can cause headaches and disorientation. But low-level constant noise also matters, and um, noise is something that regulators generally don't look at. Um, some localities have ordinances around noise um, and what they should be at the fence line of facilities or what um, communities should have. You know, there are a lot of noise ordinances against party noise and people having too good of a time, but there's um, just not enough restrictions in the permits for these um, facilities. So that's something really that needs a lot of work. 
and engines and truck traffic, um, especially if you're used to living in a rural area or a suburban area where you expect to have peace and quiet, especially in the evenings, can be very disruptive. Um, and all the other things I, I mentioned before, flaring and drilling. So what are some of the symptoms? Um, as I said, you know, a lot of these studies are kind of pointing in the same direction. Uh, back in 2012, um, Earthworks did a health survey with folks in Pennsylvania. We did it across seven counties and um, over 100 health surveys, and remarkably, we found a lot of the same symptoms um, and uh, that were being reported by folks in the same um, proximity to the facilities. And so that, and a lot of other studies have shown that too. And if more, as more studies come out, you also see consistency across the different studies, even if they're being done in many different states. Um, so volatile organic compounds that come out with the methane and that are used in, in virtually every stage of the um, production and that are also part of the gas, it's just a natural part of the gas, they're linked with um, these top symptoms tend to be headaches, dizziness, sinus problems, eye, nose, and throat irritation, and then some people um, experience over time especially aches and pains. Um, nausea and nosebleeds. Nosebleeds um, tend to be a pretty clear sign that something's going on um, and that exposure has occurred particularly in children um, who have very sensitive um, mucosal membranes. And then everybody knows about ozone, especially um, these days. Cheryl mentioned that the heat index out where she is in Ohio was over 100 today. And when nitrogen oxide that comes out of um, industrial facilities like oil and gas, and VOCs combine with the heat and sunlight, um, they can produce ground level ozone. And you know we have all these ozone alert days and there are what are called ozone corridors all over the country where it's particularly bad. And that's because there are known impacts on lung function, respiratory, and cardiovascular systems. So the contribution of all this oil and gas drilling to ozone production is a big point of study um, I mentioned this, um, this research that came out the other day from uh, Colorado, and that's been look, that was looked at there and decided that oil and gas was, I think, responsible for 50% of the ozone um, in that area. Particulate matter is also linked to respiratory problems and lung disease. This is actually really, it's par particles in the air that are formed um, from pollution, and um, there's a lot of monitoring of particulate matter going on to try to figure out um, how it moves through, through wind and how people near these facilities are affected. And then some other pollutants, and this is particularly true for water, um, can cause rashes. Um, and if you're exposed to certain pollutants um, that are airborne, um, like formaldehyde or hydrogen sulfide, it can cause a lot of confusion and verbal impairment over time. Um, a lot of people report, you know, with water contamination that they'll be in the shower and feel dizzy and then they'll get out and they have rashes. So um, those can um, be associated both air and water. And then there have been some recent studies that are showing the potential for impacts on fetal development as well as cancer risks, um, which is, you know, again, what the threat map looked at. Um, they looked at respiratory disease and cancer because we have um, government data for that. But obviously there's a whole suite of symptoms. And then just again, the constant noise and light can lead to, uh, as well as just a change in quality of life, a lot of sleep problems, which in turn can result over time in fatigue, stress, and depression. So these are all of the things that are showing up in the peer-reviewed literature for oil and gas fields. So looking ahead, um, you know, when the Marcellus and the Utica shale, Utica shale being, of course, more of an issue in Ohio, when the, when the shale booms began, um, you know, again, industry kept insisting there wasn't any scientific evidence of health impacts. So now we have all this scientific impact, um, scientific evidence. And so what they're saying now is that you can't prove cause and effect absolutely. It's what we call the point A to point B problem. You can't say that the you know, I'll go back to the slide that the compressor station that Pam Judy from Pennsylvania is standing in front of is what caused her neurological um, problems. And you can't prove that the, for, uh, that the um, pad behind Lewis Meek's home in Wyoming is what caused his water to go bad. However, um, let's remember that science isn't about absolute proof. It's never been. It's about um, a growing body of associations that over time build into a body of convincing evidence. 
Um, so I like to say that every anecdote um, is, has the potential to become a data point and that we need to take people's stories and reports very seriously um, because not only is it important for science, it's the moral and ethical thing to do. And, you know, as when industry keeps insisting you can't prove it, um, you know, we know now that there are links between smoking and cancer. Nobody doubts that anymore, even if you can't say that the single pack of cigarettes that Joe or Mary smoked, you know, 10 years ago is what caused their cancer. So I think we need to start looking at this industry in the same way, at the potential, at the threat. And in that vein, I'm going to leave you with two quotes. Um, one is by physician scientists and engineers for healthy energy, and when they did their analysis of peer-reviewed science, they made the point in the end, all forms of energy production and industrial processing have environmental impacts. This report is only focused on reviewing and presenting the available science. We make no claims about the level of impacts that should be tolerated by society. These are ultimately questions of societal values. And so that's where we all come in, where all of you come in, um, and where you know activism and engagement and pressure on regulators and policymakers is so critical because they reflect our societal values and what we want to see changed. And then there's the precautionary principle, um, even when you don't have absolute, so to speak, proof. So while we realize that human activities may involve hazards, people must proceed more carefully than has been the case in recent history. When an activity raises threats of harm to human health or the environment, precautionary measures should be taken, even if some cause and effect relationships are not fully established scientifically. So, you know, the precautionary principle also says that those who are responsible for the potential harm should be the ones to demonstrate that it's safe before moving forward. We're past that point with oil and gas, but we can do a lot to bring about more precaution and more um, restraint on the part of, of emissions and the industry. So I'm going to stop there, and I think we're going to go back to Cheryl. Thank you all for listening. I'm really sorry if I, uh, I can't see you, so hope that was um, a good overview. Thanks so much. Thanks, Nadia. That was wonderful. Really appreciate it. So now um, I'm going to take uh, the threat map and the health effects that Nadia and Molly both talked about and talk a little bit about what the state and federal government has been doing to try to rein in some of the issues that are occurring in communities. Um, so just a, a quick couple of notes about methane um, gas, which is natural gas. Um, research shows that the greenhouse gas impact on unconventional gas wells is likely higher than conventional gas, oil, and coal. Um, it was 87 times more potent of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide and is equivalent each year to 200 coal fire power plants emitting CO2 each year. Um, and then some Ohio uh, specifics regarding um, the folks that are on the ground in Ohio. And, and, you know, just looking at our attendees list, many of you are aware uh, that we have a great number of people in the state of Ohio who are affected by oil and gas development. And um, ironically, uh, Ohio has the largest population of people living within a half a mile radius, within this threat radius from oil and gas infrastructure. Ohio is number one in the nation with 3.1 million people living within a half a mile of oil and gas infrastructure. Um, we also have the highest number of schools that are located within that threat radius with over 2,500 schools. So very, very concerning. Um, that uh, our elected officials aren't taking the threat to Ohio uh, a little bit more seriously. Uh, we do have draft compressor station regulations uh, that were put out this spring. They are still in draft form. That final uh, regulation has not been uh, released, but um, you know, keep bear in mind that they will be capturing methane and volatile organic compounds from these compressor stations that it's not necessarily mean that they will be at safe levels to those that are living within this threat rate radius. In 2014, 
for new and modified oil and gas wells. So oil and gas wells that have come online in the last two years, they have implemented leak detection uh, protocols and they require quarterly monitoring with that FLIR camera uh, that Molly mentioned in her presentation. So it's a forward-looking infrared uh, camera that makes the invisible pollution and heat signatures visible to the naked eye. So new new wells since 2014 are being uh, are being researched and um, are being looked at regularly for for um, leaks. This is an industry uh, industry is doing this leak detection. Um, I don't want to in any way insinuate that our, our um, agency, Ohio EPA, is actually doing these leak detection uh, protocols. Um, so a little bit more technical, um, you can read this slide and it will tell you what they have covered under the leak detection uh, protocol in the state of Ohio. So I'll just give you a quick second to, to look at that. And um, as I said, there is a compressor station general permit that was released this spring. Uh, very concerning to us at uh, the Sierra Club is this general permit will eliminate the public hearings for individual compressor stations. And um, if um, any of you have been following the news um, earlier this year, we had record number of people turn out in the Medina and Akron area and also in the Toledo area. 400 people turned out in Akron area and over 600 people turned out in the Toledo area at public hearings for compressor stations. So this is a concerning component that they will be eliminating public hearings. And also um, all of concern to the Sierra Club and what should be on folks' radar is uh, this past Monday, the Ohio Attorney General filed suit to stop the national new source methane rule that was, uh, this was just this past Monday. So I just want to flag that for you as I go through and talk a little bit more about this uh, federal regulation. So the new source methane rule uh, was finalized in May this year. Um, it would reduce methane emissions by 45% um, of our 2012 levels. Again, methane is a precursor, an ozone precursor, and a very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, the, the new methane rule for new, new, new and modified sources would have reduced volatile organic compounds by an additional 23% above the 2012 rule. Um, and that is, that is significant, and I'll, the next slide I'll explain to you why. Uh, but it, the new source rule also included sources that were not captured under the 2012 VOC rule, including oil wells, which is important for us in the state of Ohio, where we have both oil and natural gas exploration going on, as well as new pneumatic pumps, which are a significant source of leakage. Here's a nice graph for you. Just because I'm a science walk, I wanted to include a map that, could sh that would show you the metric tons we're talking about per year of methane, these volatile organic compounds, and hazardous air pollutants uh, that will be taken out of the air uh, from this. This graph actually shows with the new and um, existing source rule. So the new rule. Um, I was telling you it was significant that that 23 additional percent of volatile organic compounds reduction, that is significant because this new source rule combined with the volatile organic rule cuts those VOCs by 95 percent from both natural gas and oil wells. So that's a significant reduction in uh, pollutants to local communities. And these are the things on the other side that are covered under this new source rule that, that uh, went on the books in June and will be implemented uh, very shortly. So any, actually any uh, well or compressor station, oil well or liquid uploading station that um, was permitted, that their permit was actually in draft form when these rules were proposed would be covered under this rule. Um, but, you know, that was just the, the, the stepping block to get where we really want to be. Where we really want to be is, um, you know, to um, not be able to not have these wells permitted in our communities if we don't want them. Uh, but what we're trying to get to is an existing source rule. 
We want an existing source rule that will bring the pollution that's already in our communities to, to minimize that. And we need an existing source rule to, to get there. And, and we had to have a new source rule in order to have the legal jurisdiction to have an existing for, source rule. So the existing source rule is what we're really pushing for. Um, will provide a real improvement in people's lives and address the air pollution that's in our communities today, the air pollution that was illustrated, that is illustrated via this threat map. So very, very important. Uh, US EPA is current, uh, just ended their co uh, information collection request so that they can begin drafting this new source rule. Um, that just finished on August 4th. But it's very likely we won't see um, a, an existing source rule until um, the next administration. So everybody cross your fingers. <laughs> um, and that's what we're doing here. We're gearing up to push for this existing source rule to happen in the first 100 days of the next administration. We, we, this, this threat map is such a good illustration of, of what kind of hazards people are living with on a daily basis. We've got these videos showing the the invisible pollution, we've got these stories on this threat map. We really want to push this next administration to, to give us this existing source rule so people's lives can start improving. Um, as I mentioned, the Attorney General um, did file a suit to stop the new source rule, which is um, very concerning considering, as I said, Ohio has the highest number of uh, people living within that half mile uh, threat radius anywhere in the country. 3.1 million people living in these um, terrible breathing conditions and uh, our Attorney General file suit to stop it. So that's why I wanted to talk to you about what you can do to help. What you can do is if you live in an affected community, um, share your story, consider sharing your story with Earthworks. Uh, some of our partners are helping Earthworks uh, gather these stories to load um, on the threat map so that they'll, this threat map will be a useful tool for other people. If you have a laptop, um, I encourage you to take it with you when you go to meet with your local school board, with your local elected officials, your state or your national elected officials. If you can't consider, if you don't have a laptop, or they don't have uh, internet connection, consider doing screenshots. Uh, we have fact sheets that are available with you. We want this to be a tool for you to, to increase attention on the, on the conditions that, that folks are living with. Um, another thing you can do, write to your local newspaper um, about your experience viewing the threat map. This is another, you know, a good press hook. Go view the threat map and then write a letter to the editor about what that experience was like for you viewing your community on this threat map. Um, and then ask your local elected officials in this threat map to take action to call for existing source rules. Or, um, or um, write about the Attorney General's decision to stop the new source rule and prevent our air from, you know, and he's just, you know, giving the go ahead for our air to just continue to get worse and worse. Um, you can consider about us uh, holding a uh, presentation in your in your community about the threat map. We can come in and train your community how to use the threat map. Um, also do some um, you know some story gathering, um, and and we have a host of other assistance that we can provide to your community uh, community members um, and and information um, about communicating uh, your stories with elected officials and. Um, there are no shortage of volunteer opportunities um, with all of our organizations. And I know there are some great organizations that are uh, participating on this call as well. Um, so at this time, I'd like to ask that if you are interested in having some assistance in, with one of these things, whether it's light, writing a letter to the other editor, whether it's hosting um, a community event in, about the threat map, how to use it, and what are some of the concerns uh, that people should be aware of, or if you're interested in a volunteer uh, um, opportunity, I'd ask for you to please raise your hand. You have the ability on your dashboard. Um, there, is, there is an option for you to raise your hand um, and just go ahead and do that, and then that will flag that for us, and we will follow up with you and make sure that you um, get the things that you need um, uh, so that you can become more involved. Um, 
So here's my contact information. If you have any questions about uh, the regulation or ideas about how you can use the threat map um, effectively to, to help uh, bring attention to what's going on in your community, please uh, don't hesitate to contact me. And uh, with that, then we, I will turn it back over to Molly and uh, we can see if we have any questions. Great, thanks Cheryl. Um, I actually don't see any questions quite yet. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and you know shout them out, or you can use the questions function and go to webinar. Or if we have anybody on the phone um, who's dialing in tonight, you can email your questions later to info at oilandgasthreatmap.com or any one of the email addresses from Cheryl, Nadia, or I that we've shared, and um, we can follow up with you later. But let's give it maybe just one second to see if we've got some questions for anybody on the phone or well. <laughs> Normally we get lots of questions. Um every <laughs> it looks like everyone's still muted. It is. Um oh. We got one question from Peggy Berry. How easy would it be to use this to write grants? Um, I'm assuming that you're meaning to use the threat map to, you know, raise awareness about an issue or, you know, the air pollution in your community and try to get some funding. I think that's a great idea. Um, I don't know of any examples where people have done that yet, but I think, you know, this map is really the first time that all of this data has been put together in this way. So. We find it to be an extremely compelling visual, but also, you know, the analysis and the, the statistics that we get out of it are also extremely compelling. It's, yeah, I do think that this would be a really compelling piece to put into um, a grant that you might be writing for a local organization, especially if you're working on air quality or air pollution. But, you know, again, we think that the half mile threat radius is pretty encompassing of other um, health impacts as well. We chose a half mile because of air emissions and air pollutants, but Again, I mean, it's it's really is the closer you are, you know, the the more at risk your you and your family could potentially be. So we do feel that the half mile is a pretty good, at least a pretty good start, a good place for us to start in terms of trying to quantify the impacts and the amount of people that are potentially at risk. All right, we have another question: um, Is the data on the map being updated regularly? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we are going through the process now of updating it um, and adding some of the new information that we talked about, but also correcting some of the errors and things that we found after rolling out the first version. Um, so it is, you know, we're constantly always tweaking it and trying to make it better. But in terms of the overall data and, you know, especially for how often we update the facility information, because obviously that's changing, you know, every day. Um, that's probably going to happen on a yearly or twice a year basis, um, pretty much as often as the data is available. Um, all of the facility data came directly from the state agencies that, that monitor and track those facilities. So, and some of them are really good about keeping their data up, up to date, and some of them are just terrible about their data and do not do a good job of monitoring and tracking. So, again, it was really important to us that we built this map with public data. Um, and that, you know, we were relying on the states and EPA and others to provide us with that data so that it was uh, a little more defensible and a little more um, of a comprehensive picture, but that does mean that we need to rely on those agencies that are not always the quickest um, to do things to get their data up so that we can use it for the map. So we haven't really come up with an exact schedule of um, how often we'll do, we'll do a massive update, but probably at least once a year. And again, like I said, we're always tweaking it as we go along. Yeah, this is Nadia. I just wanted to add um, a couple words about the data issues that, um, you know, there's a lot that researchers There we go. We're having, yeah, I was just muted for a second. Sorry. Um, it looks like we're having, um, you know, we have a lot of problems just getting data um, from state and federal agencies, and then there's a lot of gaps in the data. Um, so um, just always keep that in mind too. And I think if you guys go out and talk about the threat map or talk about what's going on in your community and your concerns, 
um, you know, you might get the response that, it, oh, it's only a few people, as Cheryl said, there are three million people in the state of Ohio within a half a mile of these facilities. Um, and in addition, um, you know, just to really emphasize that the, all of these emissions and threats are probably underestimated because of data gaps. So it's not a complete, um, you know, complete science there because of the data gaps, and that's the fault of the state agencies and industry who don't report um, their emissions. And yeah. then um, I, I also just want to emphasize with distance too, you know, again, as, as Molly's been pointing out, this half mile was a um, delineation that's really based in the science and that we have a lot of evidence for, but there really is no known distance beyond which you could call yourself safe. So, you know, air moves in a lot of funny ways and there's a lot that can be going on. So certainly there's evidence that the further away you are, the less chance there is that you might be exposed, but, um, you know, we just don't want people to think that if they're beyond half a mile, it's all hunky-dory. So, and I'm sure none of you think that, but just want to emphasize that in case you get that question um, from people as well. I think it's a great point, Nadia. And something else I like to tell people is, again, I mean, I think the Ohio map that I showed, and we can go back to that if, if folks have time or interested, but I think it's a really interesting example. I mean, it's one of the only states where we have so much yellow and not as much red. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of things that, be, that could be contributing to that, you know. Um, the pollution could be crossing a county boundary and not being accounted for the, the way that, you know, would lend itself well to the data. Um, areas might not have air monitors up um, and, you know, because a lot of this development has been so recent and has been so fast that unfortunately the air monitoring that states should be doing is not, they're just not keeping up with building new monitors and these new um, hotspots for methane and other air, poll air pollutants that are coming from these facilities. So. There's a lot of reasons that could be contributing to kind of the picture that you see of Ohio on, on the website, but again, I think the most important thing that Nadia pointed out is that there really isn't a supposed safe distance, um, and that's why it's so great that we have the data that we do in the map that can tell you if you're living within a half mile or it can show you, you know, the schools or, or hospital medical facilities that could be impacted. And so I don't see any other questions. Does, like, maybe we can do a last round. Um, I believe folks do have the ability to unmute themselves or raise your hand, or there's a lot of ways to get questions to us. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear from you, and also if you want to share any experiences you're having and questions related to that, you know, for those of you who are out there working on these issues. I'd just like to add that, uh, you know, any assistance that you guys, um, that, that folks on the, um, on the webinar uh, could, um, we could use a lot of help with the Attorney General in the state. He, um, he, you know, really stepped out of bounds on this one and I, um, it's really interesting to me that that issue has not been covered at all by mainstream press in the state of Ohio. I have not seen one newspaper in the state pick up that story. So um, he is spending our taxpayers' money, again, um, on uh, a lawsuit uh, that really could jeopardize the health of, um, of many Ohioans. So any assistance from folks on the, on the webinar would be greatly appreciated and uh, appreciate uh, all of you joining us this evening. If we don't see any other questions, I think we're probably ready to call it. People are just soaking it in. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, and have a great evening, and good luck out there. And Thanks so much, you guys. Yeah, thank you. Really, great job. Great job. Really great. And please keep an eye out from an email um, from, I believe it's going to say from GoToWebinar, um, but we have a lot of links to the slides as well as some other materials that we hope you guys find useful. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. I wonder how many people they had on.